some bad news. I knew it. I love when he does that. I do love how, I don't know, it just seems hilarious to me that, and, and I know that I'm going to get shit for this because I, I probably once upon a time believed it myself. But the idea that Hogan would nix a diamond cutter, why the fuck would Hulk Hogan care if somebody else loses a match to a diamond cutter? That doesn't make any he, sense he, to me. He, 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 look, you can't make sense out of the things that Dave Meltzer writes unless you acknowledge one simple fact. Dave Meltzer throughout his career has written from a perspective of, of, of writing glowingly in a positive way about the things that he personally likes or the people that he personally likes and simultaneously trashing, finding ways with smart ass little cheap shots, just like what you read there. That's why I didn't even comment. I'm so sick of commenting on this piece of garbage that, and I'm, I know the audience is, or at least some of them, because a lot of them encouraged me to do more of it. But unless you understand that Dave's, perspective is from a weak, insecure individual who wants people to think that he's a much more knowledgeable person uh, about this art form and world and business of professional wrestling than he really is. And the way he tries to achieve that is to write glowingly about the people that he likes and and gets along with or the product that he likes uh, to watch and finding ways to take cheap shots at the things that he doesn't and hoping that he can convince all the people that read his crap to feel just like him. That's how he feels whole as a human being. So much of what he writes, like that little, that's why I didn't even comment. It's so fucking ridiculous. I can't even get mad about it. It's laughable. But he, it's a consistent need throughout this show so far. There was a comment that, that, that Dave made that, again, I didn't react to, but I'll put it in the context of this discussion. You know, it was something, I'm paraphrasing it, but Dave said something according to you just a few minutes ago. I was like, well, it's one thing about this show. It, 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 it only serves a purpose to glorify Hogan's ego or something to that effect. That was the message, at least. Well, that's bullshit, but that's Dave. But, you know, you say that kind of stuff long enough and then the people that read it over yeah. and over and over start believing it's true and it's not true. Hogan didn't fucking nix a diamond cutter. He could care less. It didn't matter. But it was important to Dave to write that, not because it was true. Dave certainly wasn't there. Hogan didn't call Dave and say, hey, this is what I did. Neither did Paige, neither did Brutus. Right, neither did Rick Rude, but Dave felt the need to write it because it reinforced his negative feeling about Hulk Hogan and continued to kind of pile on because that's that's how Dave felt that he could get over with the anti Hogan wrestling crowd by feeding that kind of narrative. It doesn't matter if it's true or not; he doesn't give a shit. As long as you pay him ten bucks a month and you you, you believe it's bullshit, he'll keep taking your money. That's how Dave works. Good for him, man. He made a living doing it for a long time. But people need to know that when you, when you a lot of that stuff that you read is so tainted and, and, and so polluted with Dave's negative personal feelings that a lot of it isn't true or accurate. You just have to recognize it for what it is.
Hey everybody, welcome to episode 223 of the Hoots Podcast. It's your boy Joshi e. Lopez. You can follow me on the Twitters at the Hoots Podcast. Also, you can follow me on Instagram if you like. It's Joshi e. Lopez94. That's J O S H I E Lopez94 or at Josh Lopez Music. I am recording this bad boy live. In my studio apartment. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) But I am here in Chicago, Illinois. It's another week. It's another opportunity to be great. Right, fellas? Ladies? It's always a great opportunity to better yourself each and every single week. No matter what you're doing in your profession. I just wanted to say thank you for each and every single one of you who take the time out of your week to listen to the podcast. Or even take the time to retweet it when I post it on social media really means a lot to me. It shows that you do care about what I'm producing here, uh, the contributions that Brother Carter brings to these shows with, with the pre-recorded segments, like the thoughts of Derrico or what the hell is wrong with the AEW. And Brother Carter plays as much of a big role on this podcast as I do. And I'm just very grateful for the platform to come on here and um, you know just give you guys a little glimpse of the world of Joshi Lopez, you know, uh, this is my therapy session. This is my time for me to release any bad energy that I have. And more importantly, this is an opportunity for me to come on here and discuss one of the things I love the most out of life. And that's professional wrestling. And to have this opportunity to be a professional broadcaster and create wrestling content like this for the last seven to eight years has really been Humbling and the journey I thought I'd never be doing, but it's been totally worth it 100% of the way. If you're a first time listener to the podcast, I want to say thank you for giving the podcast a chance. Uh, we do things a little different here on the Who's Podcast. Um, do I hit on the weekly topics in all the wrestling companies? Yes, I do. But we like to switch things up a little bit. We like to take in questions we like having live topics. We like talking about relationships, mental health politics uh, we we're, we're not afraid to have some real dialogue with you people and i just want to say thank you for the support and uh the best way to support the who's podcast is by subscribing on apple Podcasts or spotify or anywhere you get your podcasts from we are nine listen to this guys we're nine thousand listeners away from reaching two hundred thousand on anchor and it's this has been the most successful year of the podcast so far, and I can't thank you guys enough for the the continued weekly support. All the good brothers, Sam Piopo, Brandon De Jesus, uh, Matt and Tony from the TBD Wrestling Podcast, and my guy Hoodie Patrick Frit uh, pa- uh, Patrick Fritz, which you can follow on Twitter by the way at Rated PWF. Uh, man, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, Chris Zuletta, uh, who sent a lot of great questions, which I'm going to get into in the beginning part of this podcast. The guys from New Age Insiders, Ant, Phil, uh, one of my favorite people, Issa. Um, just everybody, thank you for the support. It means a lot to me. I'm more motivated than I've ever been in my entire career. And that's the thing. I've always been driven. I've always been focused. And I've always been ready to come on here and give you the best wrestling podcast in the world. But also really good podcast in general. Uh, this is a platform for you to escape any issues or insecurities you're dealing with. Hopefully I can make you laugh. Maybe I could say something in here and you, you get uh, in your feelings about it because maybe it's a truth you want you, you don't want to hear <laughs> about wrestling. But, um, no, honestly, I, I'm just very motivated and just really happy with where the Who's podcast is right now. It's cool to see that hard work is paying off. And more importantly, I'm just having fun doing what I'm doing, you know? Like, I have ProWrestlingTransfruits.com. The site's kicking ass. Um, I'm getting excited to cover the G1, which we're going to be talking about in this podcast this week. I'm going to have a full breakdown preview for the G1 for this podcast this week. We'll get into this week in WWE as we're a couple weeks out from Clash of Champions. Also talk about um, AEW. <laughs> Believe it or not, folks, I actually enjoyed AEW Dynamite this week. But don't don't fret. Don't be shocked here. We will have a what the hell is wrong with AEW segment later on in this podcast. 
as always, if you ever have any suge- uh, suggestions, questions, anything, any business, uh, if, if you're a sponsor, oh, Blue Chew, any of these ads you hear on all these other podcasts, if you want to do some business with your boy, hit me up on uh, the Hoots Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, we could we could discuss some things, pal. Um, today's a great day. Not only is recording day, but after I'm done with this, it's the return of my favorite WWE show, NXT UK. And boy, I can't wait to do that transcript later on today. So, we got a lot to get into. Uh, last week was a little different show. I had different uh, live topics that I wanted to get into in the beginning part of the show. And I was, I, I, last week I was really, really... Trying to break down the root behind my issues with AEW as a whole and their messaging and their content. I still see it throughout Twitter. Like, they they act like petty high school kids that, um, it, it reminds me of the kids I went to high school with. They were in AP class and they act like they were holier than Dow, uh, than other people just because they were in AP classes and they're, they thought they're smarter than other people and it's like, Get off your fucking high horse. You ain't shit, <laughs> to be honest with you. And, and that's the thing. I, I just, I, I will never vibe with people who come off with, who come off as pretentious, or act their, ho- or act like they're holier than thou. You're not. Nobody's above anything, and no wrestling company's above another one. Okay, what, what makes your wrestling elite? Honestly, so. The questions we're going to do here for this first segment, um, I, this is something I'm looking to do as the weeks go by. Like I said, I want to hear from you guys. It's not just me. I want to do the show for you guys as well. So you can ask me literally anything in the world, and I'll give you an answer to it. So I want to send out a special shout out to Chris Zaletta, a good brother to the podcast and the TBD Wrestling Podcast as well. He sent a couple of great questions, and I'm going to answer this in the first segment here, and then we'll get into what happened this week in WWE. So first one, here we go, is Joshy, what's up? Here's some questions for the show, brother. First one, does Apollo still join the Hurt Business, or do you think Cedric Alexander was the backup plan? I thought Cedric Alexander was always the guy uh, when it came to who was going to join a hurt business. Raw needs more baby faces, and you're what you're getting right now with the Paul Cruz is basically him showing his edge, his other gear, if you will, as a baby face character. We know that he smiles and that he's a great person. And now you're seeing the grit in him. And I like what I've seen from Paul Cruz as a baby face. Uh, the Hurt Business, I, I've made no bones about it. I'm a mark for the heart of the Hurt Business. It's one of the best wrestling factions right now. Uh, it's my favorite thing on Monday Night Raw right now as we speak. And I think Cedric is a great addition for the group. And I always thought Cedric was the right guy for the Hurt Business. I do not think he was a backup plan. Second question. Should AEW get rid of the ranking system? Yes. <laughs> yes, they should. Because they don't... They don't... Um, they don't even adhere to their ranking systems at times. And... <laughs> how many times I come on here and mention that fact that... Whenever somebody gets signed... Uh, that came from other promotions... They automatically give title shots. Them. So what does it even matter what the rankings are? Like, they had the Young Bucks against Jurassic, Jurassic Express at All Out. It was a cold match just to pad the Young Bucks stats. I, I, that, that's just another thing with AEW. Like, you want me to really think that your wins and losses uh, wins and losses matter? But actually, they don't. More times than not, when you watch their product, they do as much 50-50 booking as WWE does in... I don't even go into rabbit hole on that whole 50-50 booking thing because I think that's a stupid uh, talking turn that wrestling fans have in 2020. But nonetheless, let's move on to the next one. Who do the Bulls take fourth overall come the draft? I'll be honest with you. uh, Due to the pandemic and my lack of interest in college basketball, I have absolutely no idea who would be the right person for the Bulls. 
I guess if you look at the positions right now, I'd probably say another point guard would work out for the team right now. Um, the only thing I know about the draft this year is that um, LaMelo Ball is in it. <laughs> Honestly, that's the only thing I know about the draft. So I have no idea who the Bulls are going to get. First, we need to figure out who our head, her new head coach is going to be. That's what we need to figure out first. So <laughs> um, I'm, I'm excited to see what Art Carney, or as uh, as Jonathan Hood likes to call him, what, what um, Arturis Karnisivis and uh, Mark Aversley does because... It's a new regime here for the Bulls, and I'm excited to see who their new head coach is first. So, um, great question, though. I'm, I'm really excited for the future for the Bulls now. Uh, next question. Ooh, we got a football one. Super Bowl prediction. Alright, so last week, I reminded you guys that I'm a Chicago Bears fan, right? And I said, I was, I said the team was going to be 10-6. I'm still sticking with that. That's my record for the team this year. But as far as the Super Bowl is concerned, my Super Bowl prediction match and winner is New Orleans against Baltimore. Uh, I got the Ravens versus the Saints, and I have Drew Brees winning his final Super Super Bowl and riding off in the sunset. So I'm going with the Saints to win the Super Bowl this year. Good question, though. There's a lot of good choices. I just don't see – I really don't believe the Chiefs are repeating – and I don't think the Texans are making the playoffs this year. So that's my thoughts. Next question. If you were to create a writing team for any wrestling company, who would you bring in bring, bring in out of wrestlers, podcasters, and friends? Oh, man. This is a good question. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> um... Man, if I really wanted to be like selfish and ego maniacal like a lot of, like a lot of these podcasters, I would just say this have me be the only writer, but I'm not gonna do that. Man, there's a lot of great people with a lot of uh great perspective on the product and not just looking at it from one side of the lens. First off, I think I would start off with um Eddie. Eddie McCabe from the New Age Insiders. That would be the first guy I would reach out to. Um, Eddie's not only a great wrestling mind, but also a a guy that understands production and understands how to create TV content. So I would go with Eddie from the New Age Insiders. And I also add um, uh, Jason Maltow to the list as well because he has creative ideas as well. So get the... Start with Tandem there. My writing team wouldn't be that big, to be honest with you, Chris. I'd probably say like 10 people at the most. So we got Eddie and Jason. I bring in Ant because me and Ant are brothers and we just vibe with each other. Uh, I see a lot of myself with Ant so I can see him uh, as part of the group. Obviously, I got to have B-Rob, Rob, Matt, um, Tony. Well, I I don't know if I would have Tony in the writing room. He could be a writer. I'm not taking that away from him. But I'd rather have Tony be my referee uh, and backstage producer than just a writer. So um, I'll have Matt in there. Uh, He'll he'll take over the women's side of the department. Man. And then you gotta have people with experience as well, you know. I, I I would bring in Eric Bischoff. I would just to understand his dialogue and being a liaison to the TV networks and what they want from the product is very important. It's something that not a lot of wrestling fans really acknowledge because it's always nuts and bolts. What's happening in the ring? Who's getting booked right? Who's getting booked wrong? It's not about what the actual behind the scenes and everything that goes into these shows. Uh, so I would have Eric Bischoff. I would keep Bruce Pitchford as well. You need to have experienced people that are accomplished in what they do. No matter how you feel about the current product, Bruce Pritchard has a track record, and you can believe and rely on what he does. So I, I would keep Eric and Bruce as guys who've had experience as well in there. Um, and then if I wanted to add anybody else, uh, more importantly, I'd add my main brother, my man, uh, Adam Daly. 
he he would be my co-partner as my writing guy. And I, I can't forget, uh, we need like an overseer. We need a chairman for my wrestling company. The chairman would be Jonathan Hood. <laughs> so uh, I have a lot of options to pick from here. So let's go down the list, all right? Eddie Jason. We'll have Brother Carter in there as well. Matt Ant from Rant with Ant, right? Uh, Bruce Pritchard, Eric Bischoff, Adam Daly's my co-writer, and jo- and Jonathan Hood as the chairman of the board, pal. <laughs> so there you go. If it was up to you, would you scrap the Saudi shows for WWE? Um, my answer to that question would be no. And I'm not going to come in here and justify what they do out there in Saudi Arabia. It's, it's, it's disgusting. It's appalling. I do believe that all countries deserve an opportunity to see the WWE. So that's why I never really got in the soapbox about, oh, why are they doing these super showdown uh, super showdown shows at, um, in Saudi Arabia? It really didn't bother me. It was just another show to transcribe. And another country is getting an opportunity to see wrestling. And they need to fix their issues. Nobody's not acknowledging that. But I think other countries do deserve to see uh, professional wrestling. Would I have multiple shows in Saudi Arabia? No. But I wouldn't overall scrap the idea that they can't do shows in Saudi Arabia. I I wouldn't agree to that. And then, finally, is there any WWF slash WWE pay-per-views you wish you could bring back? My pick would be Armageddon. Armageddon would be my pick because I think that's a better foot note, like, pay-per-view to to close out the year. That that would honestly be my pick. Uh, I've I've always been a fan of the Armageddon pay-per-view. I like the sets. All the rest of it talks about we want these unique sets back. Uh, Armageddon always was the ones that I enjoyed the most. So I, I'd probably say Armageddon would be the main like pay per view that I would bring back from the past. Uh, I think King of the Ring is something that's special that you could keep like, as a network special, but I wouldn't constitute it as a pay per view that I would bring back. So Armageddon would probably be on the top of my list, and hopefully they don't do a Cyber Sunday again because I'm so tired of having f- freaking social media dictate what's right and wrong in professional wrestling in 2020. So, um, yeah, Chris, I want to thank you so much, brother, for uh, sending these questions. These were awesome. Um, really thought-provoking. And um, and you could be like Chris, man. If you guys ever have any questions, uh, things you want to get my thoughts on in the world of wrestling or sports, uh, hit, hit me up. I'll answer them for you. All right, let's get into this week in WWE. We're going to start off with what I saw last night, actually, on NXT. Another strong show. Started off with a barn burner with Eel Shry and Shotzi Blackheart. Uh, absolutely wonderful match. Um, everybody talks about it, and it's pretty common knowledge that NXT's women's division is just absolutely top tier. And... I just love what they do. I love their product. I, I love their division. Uh, EO and Shotzi had a fantastic match. It went on nearly 20 minutes. If you haven't had a chance to watch this match, go out of your way to check it out. You can find the breakdown on ProWrestlingTranscriptions.com. But the match was just absolutely fun to uh, jot down last night, so I really enjoyed that. And then, you know, we had a really good promo from Finn Balor, and I, I really like what I've seen from this Prince iteration of Finn Balor in NXT, and uh, he's doing a great job, and obviously that's why he's the NXT champion right now. William Regal announced that there's going to be a Fatal 5-Way Gauntlet Eliminator match. So basically, the concept is, you start off with two people in the ring, every four minutes another wrestler comes into the ring. Now, after that, it becomes a full basic elimination match and whoever's the last man standing will fight Finn Balor for the NXT title at NXT TakeOver I wonder if they're going to add a different name for this TakeOver that's taking place on October 4th I don't know it, right now it just says NXT TakeOver what is it NXT TakeOver 
Aunt Jemima pancakes <laughs> is it NXT takeover uh waterfall I, I we we need to let's let's come up with some names for the next NXT takeover uh, we need to figure out what it is um so that that was Finn Balor that was my thoughts on that and then other stuff that stood out to me there was a really good tag team title match that I saw last night uh Bree Zangle uh and Imperium had to rematch uh, match was longer than I thought it was going to be, so I was happy for the appearing boys that they weren't going to be tossed to the side and made to look like jokes before they head back to the UK. So I really, really enjoyed that match. So Bree Singo is still your NXT Tag Team Champions. And then um, my favorite part of the show last night was uh, Damian Priest and Timothy Thatcher. That's my uh, favorite match of the week that I transcribed so far. Um, we're gonna get into the whole stuff with the parking lot, lot, parking lot fight, uh, with AEW later on, and I love that too, but my favorite match, personally, just for match reasons, was, uh, Damian Priest and Timothy Thatcher, so another strong, strong episode from NXT last night, and their brand is just good, man, they, they, <laughs> There's not part of the show where you start questioning yourself, why am I watching this? And I just like what Triple H, Shawn Michaels, Road Dogg, and William Regal do down there in NXT. Um, also, let's set a weekly uh, appreciation to Casey Cazaro. Um, just another under- underrated waterfall as well. So <laughs> uh, we'll transition to uh, what happened on SmackDown last week before we get into Raw. SmackDown, again, hit it, uh, hit a home run, knocked it out of the ballpark, hit it straight out of Comiskey Park, pal. Um, where do we start? Everything that's going on with Roman Reigns and Jay Uso and Paul Heyman, I'm here for it. I'm down for it, down since day one-ish, ish. <laughs> I'm all in with Roman Reigns versus Jay Uso. The, the whole thing with Roman being the tribal chief, and he's like... We're not kids. I'm still going to beat your ass. <laughs> it, it was awesome. And then they had a match. Oh, the main event was Roman and Jey Uso against uh, Sheamus and King Corbin. They announced earlier today, I saw this on Twitter, that um, tomorrow they're doing a rematch, but it's a Samoan street fight. So I was kind of expecting that. And that's, that's fine. You, one thing, the common theme, the common thought I had with this week of programming, good or bad from WWE this week when it came to Raw and SmackDown, was the fact that we're at the point right now, we're in this like middle wavelength towards the next pay-per-view. So these next couple shows before the last go-home shows are basically plot points. That's all it is. We're getting to one show to the next. Um... You know, I I liked I really liked SmackDown. I thought Raw was okay this week. I didn't I didn't love it or anything like that, but I thought Raw was okay. Um, when it came to SmackDown, I just really enjoyed their show. Uh, you know, you had the rematch for the Intercontinental Champion with AJ Styles and Jeff Hardy. Sami Zayn still in his feelings because he feels like he's the rightful Intercontinental Champion since he never got pinned for it, uh, even though he decided to take five months off. Uh, looks like that's heading into a triple threat match at Clash of Champions, which is fine with me. Um, let's talk about the Bailey promo. Let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about the Bailey promo from SmackDown this week and her opportunity to, you know, explain her reasoning, if you will, as to why she attacked Sasha Banks the way she did. And I'm pulling this up right now. And I don't know if she needed to sit in the chair just to cut the promo like that, but I guess it was a good visual, so I'm not really going to complain about it. But I wanted to read this portion of the promo that I wrote down, and I want to get your guys' thoughts on this as I read this out to you, okay? So, seriously, after everything we've been through, who knows you better than me? Nobody. You're waiting for the right time to strike. You kept me close. In my first break at WWE, you brought me in as your tag team partner, just to keep me close enough. When I had my first Raw Women's Championship match, you made sure to be right there and be a part of it, because you need to be close. 
You found me this year to Friday Night Smackdown, and when you saw me at the top of my game, you needed to become Two Belts Banks, didn't you? You pretended to be my best friend, but all along you were using me. And do you know how I know that? Because I was using you. I never cared about you, and I damn sure didn't care about our friendship. I used you every single step of the way, and thanks to you, I became Bailey Doe Straps, the first ever Grand Slam Women's Champion, and thanks to you, I am the longest reigning SmackDown Women's Champion. But after last week, you are completely useless to me. So I've had just about a week to really, like, take a step back and process this promo and, you know, you do your back and forth thing. Do I like it? Was it too uh, laid back and not as much Venom coming out? Uh, did I did I enjoy the promo or not? You know, I've been one of the most critical of Bailey's heel work uh, uh, over the last couple months. I've made no bones about that. I, I don't take back anything that I said. But honestly, looking back to it and watching this promo again this morning, um, I enjoyed it. I, I thought Bailey did a really good job. Now, here's the thing. How long do we go with this Sasha Banks and Bailey feud? How long can we realistically go with this? Is this honestly something that you think you could fully invest yourself going into WrestleMania next year? And closing it off and letting them go their separate ways after that. Honestly, can you honestly tell me that you're going to be fully invested and be like, Oh my god, I'm so sick of this Sasha Bailey thing. Oh, why didn't... Like, can you really do that? I'm just saying. Um, I did. I, I, I like the promo. Now, all you heard during football... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, all during football, we heard these promos for Sasha Banks uh, come back to SmackDown tomorrow to get her side of the story. So excited to see her, and I just think that's a really cool like uh, thing marketing wise that you know you get to hear Michael Cole during uh, during a quarter of a football game promoting that Sasha's going to be back on the show. And I, I just thought that was a pretty cool spot for WWE and, uh, Sasha Banks more specifically. So, and by the way, congrats to Sasha. They came out with the announcement that she's going to be in, uh, Disney's, uh, Mandalorian, uh, show that's, um, part of the Star Wars, uh, family of shows. And, um, yeah, she looked amazing in the trailer. So, um, Congratulations, Sasha, because I think that was really cool. And then, um, you know, you had uh, Lucha Haas Party defeat uh, Cesaro and Nakamura thanks to the help with um, the Street Profits, part of the whole brand of brand invitational, which led into what happened on Monday Night Raw, which we'll talk about right now. Um, you know, Raw, I, I thought the match with Cesaro and Nakamura with Street Profits was really good. Street Profits won, uh, thanks to the, um, cash out splash, I think is what Michael Cole said that Dawkins did to, uh, Cesaro. Uh, I thought that was a good match. Um, I don't know what's going on recently with WWE with matches. I like, I'm, I, I am accustomed to knowing that a lot of WWE matches on TV, more specifically, will add sometimes more in disqualifications or no contests because they're building one thing to the next. And I, I will give them credit for that. Uh, more times than not, the finishes to their matches are actually adhering to the characters and the storyline that's happening in the ring as opposed to what's the best finish for the match. Or what would be a satisfying fish for Twitter or Dave Meltzer's of the world, you know? They're, pl they're placating to their story. Even then, I don't know what happened with Asuka and Mickey James. I don't. And the sad part about it is that they had a fantastic match. And anybody that tries to tell you that Mickey James is not one of the greatest women's wrestlers of all time, they're lying straight to your face. She freaking killed it on Monday night, and I thought she did a wonderful, wonderful job. Uh, she looked amazing as well, but I keep mentioning this. 
when we have these odd finishes or things that come off and the wind comes off the sails, I don't know if it's Vince or Kevin Dunn, but you have to have your commentators protect the finishes of the matches, even if there's not even a conclusive winner. So, yeah, okay, you have your initial shock and confusion, but when you have that let it dry out and spread throughout the whole feel of after the match, it's not a good look. Like, we have this deadpan Michael Cole reaction to this uh, conclusion that I guess the thing was that it looked like Mickey's uh, feet was out from under her and they wanted to protect her so they decided to go with a quick finish. I don't know if that was true or not. I don't know. But when you have something like that or an odd situation with a DQ or a countout situation, you need to have your commentators keep the energy going for the program, the wrestlers in the ring, and your show. If you're just going to be sitting there and acting confused, you have to keep the, the show flowing for your audience. You are the storytellers. You are the narrators. You have to keep the reactions going. You got to keep the energy going. More importantly, so I, I, I didn't, I didn't like that. I, I really didn't. What I did like though was seeing Braun Strowman and Raw Underground. I thought that was an interesting sight. I, I already mentioned earlier how much I liked, I, I love the Hurt Business. So I'm all in with that. Um, Ricochet and Cedric Alexander had a really good match as well. And then we had um, Dominic and Seth Rollins match in the steel cage match. Uh, Seth Rollins won. Uh, Seth Rollins earlier show was saying that he didn't want Buddy Murphy to come at ringside. Obviously, Murphy didn't listen, so he paid the price after. But it was an interesting little visual where Aaliyah, because... Um, Dominic has had his family <laughs> basically at ringside for all his matches in SummerSlam, basically. And Aaliyah is walking to set so they could check on Dominic after he had, like, the two curb stomps, right? And um, Aaliyah, like, trying to check on Murphy. And I thought that was interesting because you remember when um, Buddy Murphy lost his series of matches to Aleister Black, right? Uh, he was downtrodden, despondent, didn't know what was happening next. What was happening next? And then uh, Seth Rollins picked them up. So I thought that was kind of interesting. A little uh, twist and turns that I don't know if any of you guys picked up on it. But I don't know what it means. I don't know where it goes. But uh, also at the same time, I don't have to know all those answers at the same time. So I, I, I thought that was very interesting. And Dominic once again killing it in the ring. Um, we got to see what's 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 down the road for Dominic. I'm really curious to see what happens next for him. But it definitely looks like we're getting into a Seth Rollins, Buddy Murphy feud. And I am here for it, pal. And then we talk about the uh, main event this week. Keith Lee and Drew McIntyre. So, Drew McIntyre this week... Um, for, for the beginning the show seemed to be really giddy and sarcastic for a guy that got kicked in the head three that got kicked in the head three times a few weeks ago. I'm not saying that I'm not enjoying what Drew uh, Drew McIntyre is doing as a character or as a champion because I've I have been and I feel like at times I have needed to defend his title reign because some people are looking at it from the wrong lens. Go guys, we're we're in this freaking pandemic. Of, pandemic era of wrestling, we can't uh, apply the same thoughts that we'd have on a regular show that has 20,000 people in it, because that's that gauge is not there and I'm sorry guys, I'm not allowing Twitter to be the fucking gauge of what's good or not in wrestling, I can have my opinions and my view of wrestling, you can have yours I, we need to start thinking for ourselves, we need to stop having Twitter dictate how we feel about these shows for the love of God so, I really enjoyed what Drew McIntyre's done as a champion. When it comes to their promos, though, it's sometimes they're good, and sometimes, like Monday in the beginning, the beginning of the show, he's like overly sarcastic, and I I really don't know where he's going with that at times. Like like maybe he hasn't always said that he's uh, being. Uh, 
being goody two shoes or kissing babies and fat girls or stuff like that, you know. Uh, you, I, I don't think he's ever mentioned that he was going to be just fully straight baby face the entire time. But when I watched your magazine, it brings up this question. What really constitutes a baby face in 2020 in a society where everybody is so cynical to a fault that they don't even acknowledge how cynical and fickle they are at times? What really makes an intriguing baby face to you? And please don't tell me booking. Please. Kenny Omega has the most wins in AEW and I could give two shits whether he's on the show or not. He does nothing for me as a baby face. So I want to know. I watched Drew McIntyre. He's been having a wonderful run as WWE Champion. Especially the WWE Championship matches he's been having have been fantastic. But for whatever reason, you see people, they're like, Oh, I'm so tired of Drew McIntyre. When are we going to move on to the next thing? Is he really a good champion? Like... What what really has to constitute a baby face in 2020? And don't tell me Orange Cassidy either, because that is not a baby face. So, do baby faces and heels matter anymore? Because we all know that selling doesn't matter <laughs> anymore, unfortunately. So I really want to know. What really constitutes a baby face in 2020? And can you give me an example of what that looks like. I want to know. So. Yeah. That was my thoughts on this week in WWE. Uh, I thought SmackDown had. Again had a. The head advantage over Monday Night Raw this week. Um, And we're about. Two and a half weeks away from Clash of Champions. So. Be excited to see Randy Randy Orton come back to Raw. And get a good promo for him. Obviously. uh, Sooner or later. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what happens um, for Clash of Champions. I think it's going to be a good pay-per-view. And, um, yeah, that was my thoughts this week for WWE. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we are two days away from the start of the 30th annual G1 Climax Tournament. This is going to be the fourth consecutive year that I've had the opportunity to cover this tournament. And it's something that I look forward to every single year, no matter how I feel about the landscape of wrestling during that time period or not. Uh, The G1 has been something that I've been very grateful for over the last couple of years. Because I think as I've covered more tournaments and more New Japan shows over the last couple of years... I really feel like those shows have helped me become a better transcriber. And when I'm looking at the field here for this G130 Climax tournament, which is starting on Saturday, I'm fucking pumped, man. <laughs> I really am. I'm I'm so freaking excited for this uh, show, this tournament. There's 19 events. There's going to be 114 matches on this tour, six for each show, doing the math, pal. Um, and, man, it's going to be insane. So, let's start off with me reading off the people who are participating in this tournament. So, we start off with Block A. We got Okada, Kota Ibushi, Jeff Cobb, Tomohiro Ishii, Will Ospreay, Shingo Takagi, Minoru Suzuki, Jay White, Taichi, and Yujiro Tagahashi. Like, I'm pausing you to, like, really resonate with what I just read off in one block. You have all those people in one block. Oh man, A block or I don't know if there's ever gonna be one bad match in in the uh A block uh for the sermon. Holy shit man. Think about this. You have Osprey and Shingo in a rematch, one of my favorite matches that I see in the last couple years. Uh we're gonna see Shingo against Okada or Shingo and Abushi. Uh same thing, like Ishii's fighting Abushi, Okada. I, all these guys are fighting each other in this block. That's the coolest thing about the G1. 
all these five, all these guys fight each other, and whoever has the most points out of each block, they fight each other in the finals in the G1, and the winner gets the main event slot at Wrestle, King, Wrestle Kingdom 15 next year. Oh my God, man! So that's the A block. Here's the B block. You got the champion Naito, Evil Kenta, Hiroshi Tanahashi, Juice Robinson, Hiroki Goto, Yoshihashi. Toriano, Zack Sabre Jr., and Sonata. I don't know why we need to have Yano in every G1. I'll never understand it. I'll never agree with it. I don't know why he's in it. But he's in it. So, <laughs> the B block, don't sleep on the B block either, man. Like, look at this matchup here. You can have Goto and Kenta as a rematch Wrestle King this year. Um, Hiroshi Tanahashi and Naito, another uh, Wrestle Kingdom rematch from a few years ago. Um, you, you gain another adrenaline rush from Yoshihashi is, uh, over the last couple of months recently. So let's see what he does. Uh, Zack Sabre Jr. in a tournament against, uh, his partner in Bullet, uh, in Suzuki Guns. Um, you have Evil, Kenta, all of LIJ outside of um, Shingo are in the B block, so uh, those could be some personal battles. But I just want to read off a couple of matches on these cards here before I give you my predictions for the uh, G1 as far as who, I'm, who I think is going to win the G1 this year. But um, I, I'll tell you this before we get into that. I A big part of me in my heart really wants Tomohiro Ishii to win this tournament because he deserves it. He's my favorite person in New Japan. He's the reason why I got it, why I got hooked into New Japan, and the guy's just fucking awesome. I, I, I'm, I'm not naive. I'm pretty sure Ishii won't win the tournament or even rank in the top three as far as points getters. But I really do hope he wins it because that guy freaking deserves it. But let's read off some of the matches here. Like for example, Saturday, you have. Osprey against Yuzro. This is Osprey's first match back since the pandemic started. Jeff Cobb against Taichi. Uh, I think these guys fought each other in last re- uh, last year's G1, if I'm not mistaken. Minoru Suzuki and Ishii. Look at that. The first draw for Ishii is the never openweight champion Suzuki. Oh my god, that match is going to be insane. And then... Jay White against Shingo, and then the main event for A Block is Okada and Abushi. A match that can main event a Wrestle Kingdom is the first match, the first main event of uh, night one. Then we go for the B Block for their first round of action. We have Juice Robinson and Yoshihashi, Sonata against Toriano, Kenta and Hiroki, Go- Hiroki Goto, Evil and Zack Jr., Zach Jr., who've had a lot of matches with each other over the last couple of years, so that should be easy one to jot down. And then Naito and Tanahashi are following up Ibushi and Okada, so. Man. Man, some of these matches in the first week alone are just absolutely going to be insane. Um, you know, you have other matches down the card, down the road, like, uh, Okada will be fighting, uh, Jay White, uh, rematch with G1 Supercard. On that same card, you got Osprey and Shingo, Ibushi and Ishii, Suzuki and Cobb. Jot that down, guys. September 27th, a week, uh, two weeks from Sunday. How can you go wrong with that? No, a week from Sunday. Oh, wow, man. That, that line is insane. Cobb Suzuki, Abushi Ishii, Osprey Shingo, and Okada J. White. Holy shit, man. <laughs> Can you guys tell that I'm excited for the G1? Oh, man. This will be a lot of fun. As always, I, I I I want you guys to bookmark ProWrestlingTransfers.com as I'm going to be updating the standings and letting you guys know what's going on with the G1 as I'm covering each and every single event. And let's get into it. Let's talk about who I have winning the G1 this year, pal. My pick to win the G1 this year. Is Ibushi. I 
I saw Bushi. No, I'm gonna pull Steve Harvey here. I'm sorry, guys. That was a lie. <laughs> I'm, I'm, re- I'm backtracking now. <laughs> uh, no, honestly, I, I think my pick for the G1 this year, who I think is gonna win, Jay White. Jay White is gonna win the G1 tournament this year. Heard it right here, first here on the Hoots podcast. Jay White will win the 2020 G1 Climax Tournament. It'll be Jay White and Tanahashi coming out of the B block. And they'll fight each other. And Jay White will win and get a shot at Wrestle Kingdom 15 for Naito. So Jay White, the Switchblade, will win the G1 this year. I'm, t- I'm typing this out on Twitter right now. As mentioned on this week's edition of hashtag the Hoots Podcast, which you subscribe to right now on all your favorite podcasting platforms. Um, I'm going with Jay White to win to, to win the G130. Boom. Right there. It's right there for your marbles, pal. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my preview for the G1. Like I said, I have all the matches, all the events that are going to be there for you for, for you guys on the website. And it's going to be a lot of fun to jot down. We're going to get to our final segment here for the Hoots Podcast this week. And I wanted to let you guys know. That, believe it or not, I actually enjoyed Dynamite this week. So, with that, I decided that I wanted to bring this down into one big segment. Instead of doing multiple and then going into the... Dun, 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 dun. Let's, give, let's, give, let's give it all. Let's dish out all our cards and have one full AEW segment before we close off the podcast this week. Okay? And also, don't forget, we have a Thoughts of Derrico <laughs> uh, episode for you guys right at the end of the podcast. So, be on the lookout for that. So, with that said, I'm going to recap AEW Dynamite. But also, it's time, everybody. It's time for everybody's favorite segment in 2020. The best segment to come out of the quarantine era of Pro Wrestling Podcast. It is... What the hell is wrong with A E W? It's time for What the hell is wrong with A E W? What the hell is wrong? With AEW. I really only have a couple things to say about what the hell is wrong with AEW this week. And the first one, I hate to say it, but I've got to say it. Chris Jericho needs to be off of television. The only thing that he has going him going for him right now is his entrance theme. And Judas is awesome, and I love it. But right now, what does he bring to the show? He doesn't bring anything to the show. He's been in a, he's been in a feud with Orange Cassidy, fine, but it ended up in a lackluster mimosa match, which nobody wants to see. I just want to see the two of them in a wrestling match because that's what all elite wrestling is supposed to be is this, this great alternative wrestling program, but they haven't, but with Jericho, you know, his pretty much since he debuted, he's gone up a little bit, but then since he's lost the AEW world title to John Moxley, his 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 stock has just been going down and down and down and down. He's great on commentary, so maybe he just needs to stick with that and just let his entrance theme run through. But Chris Jericho needs to be off of television. He's bringing nothing new to the broadcast right now. And why the hell is he in a tag team with Jake Hager? Who wants to see that? Hager is not good. Jericho being with Hager is only going to bring him down. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I think they're oversaturating the tag team division, which I actually think is a good division. But what are Jericho and Hager adding to the tag team division? You've already got a number of great tag teams in there. FTR, Jurassic Express, the Young Bucks, 
what the Young Bucks are doing right now with this whole heel turn, I think, is actually pretty stupid. But I get why they're doing it. I don't like it, but I, I get why they're doing it. They're, they should just stick with in-ring action because they're great at that. You So you've got a number private party, which I thought did a great job last night. So there's a number of great tag teams in the company. Why are Jericho and Hager adding to it? It makes no sense to me, and Jericho needs to be off of television. Speaking of which, I think they're, that they're also just... Too many stables right now in AEW. You've got a, and factions and stuff like that. And the ones that they have aren't working. I mean, the inner circle is kind of phased off a little bit. It used to be the strong group, so they've kind of phased off. And you've got the Dark Order, which is kind of worthless. I mean, we all, you all know what I think about the Dark Order. You've got the Nightmare family, which they were, they weren't even seen on, actually both Dark Order and the Nightmare family weren't even seen on Dynamite this week, which again, if you're trying to build something with these guys, why, why did you leave them off of television? You know, you've got Taz trying to do his group. So I, I just, I, I, you know, now they're saying MJF is going to join a faction, which that makes no sense to me. MJF needs to be by himself. So I, I just, 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 you know, maybe you've got the Dark Order. Maybe you've got the Nightmare Family, but just leave it at that. That's all you need. Because, again, I think the Inner Circle is kind of phasing out, and MJF needs to not be with a faction. And really, that's all I've got this week. I, again, as I said earlier, as I said in, and I don't know when you're hearing this, but I thought AEW overall was a good show. But still, by and large, you've got to ask, what the hell is wrong with AEW? This has been What the Hell is Wrong with AEW. Thank you, Brett Carter, for that submission for what the hell is wrong with AEW this week. I'll give you my thoughts on that uh, topic in a couple minutes. But first, I wanted to give you my thoughts on what happened in AEW Dynamite last night that I did enjoy. And uh, I think this is the first <laughs> Dynamite episode that I enjoyed in the last two or three months Let's start off with um, this. I really enjoyed the Thunder Rosa uh, NWA World Women's Championship match with Ivelisse. Um, as the old Lucha Underground fan in me was really happy to see these two girls just beat the crap out of each other and tear the house down uh, during the second hour of Dynamite last night on TNT. And it was just a really, really good match. So I really enjoyed that. Uh, big props to Thunder Rosa and the beautiful uh, Barrican Waterfall uh, Ivelisse. Uh, they did a wonderful job in that match. What was the other match that I enjoyed on this show? Ooh, I just remembered. Hangman Page and Freaky Gazarian. That was a fantastic match. Um, I, I was telling Brother Carter this as we were talking last night. AEW needs more matches like that on television. That was a fantastic match. Hangman Page and Frankie Kazarian uh, ripped it up. It was a, a tremendous match, and I really, really enjoyed it. We found out that it's going to be John Moxley, Darby Allen, and Will Hobbs against Lance Archer, Brian Cage, and Ricky Starks in a six-man tag team match next week. Uh... The caveat here is if Lance Archer beats uh, John Moxley on the anniversary show on October 14th, the machine Brian Cage will get his shot at the AEW world title. So we have a little working relationship here for now with Team Taz and Jake Roberts and Lance Archer. But honestly, does anybody believe that's really going to last long? I don't. <laughs> It'll backfire, and unfortunately, cosplay Stone Cold will still be uh, the AEW World Champion. Doesn't Moxie look a little bit more like Bill Burr with hair these days, by the way, too? <laughs> I just wanted to mention that. And then, let's get into it. Let's talk about the thing I love the most from Dynamite this week. And I'm, I'm, it's, it's been a pretty well echo sentiment as well. It's the um, parking lot fight with Santana and Ortiz and... Best friends. Shout out to you, Justin Roberts. Best friends. That match was awesome. <laughs> that fight was awesome. Everything about the parking lot fight was awesome. 
it was really, really good and really fun to watch. Um, you you watch um, some of the spots they did. I mean, especially the fish. You know, Beretta does that dude butts, uh, dude buster, or as Excalibur calls it, crunchy. Uh, he, he does it through plywood on the back of a truck. Uh, it's just <laughs> it's nasty spots. Uh, I saw Santana hitting best friends with the baton. Um, Santana was bleeding. Uh, Chuck Taylor was getting his ass with some nasty spots as well. I think Beretta's shoulder started bleeding at their one nasty spot. Uh, I think Taylor did like a spike pile driver to Santana on the hood of a car. Uh, and then... Like I mentioned, uh, the whole finish was predicated with everybody's favorite wrestler in AEW, Pockets, uh, popping out of the truck with a steel chain wrapped around his fist and clocks, uh, or T, I don't know, clocks Santana with the, um, orange punch. I thought Orange Cassidy was a good guy. I thought Best Friends were a good guy tag team. I guess it doesn't matter in the pocket parking lot fight, I guess. But I don't want to take that away. But I did have to mention that, though. Uh, <laughs> Orange Cassidy helps Best Friends defeat the Inner Circle. Uh, so that advances uh, Best Friends' record to 16-6 and six right now in 2020. So I thought those three matches alone gave this a favorable grade for Dynamite for myself this week. Um, but... Here posed the question, what the hell is wrong with AEW this week? And what's wrong with AEW this week is one of the things that's been wrong with AEW since the inception of the company. And that's a guy that I never thought that I would lose respect for. A guy that was one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. A guy that just was awesome in every sense of the world. Is Chris Jericho? You know, you heard um, you heard Brother Carter mention the fact that he thinks that um, Chris Jericho should take some time off of TV, and I agree with him as well. Chris Jericho is starting to lose value as the weeks go by. First off, he looks like what Axl Rose would look like in a wrestling ring today. I wanted to play this clip here, and I got really upset on Saturday night. Um, I There's one thing in wrestling that I can't stand in just life. I keep mentioning it. It's people talking out of both sides of their mouth. So... There was a Chris Jericho, the headline maker, pal. Um, <laughs> he um, did a couple interviews and explained that he was the one that gave Miro the whole line about the brass ring promo. And I mentioned that last week. And here's the thing. Here's the quote. It says, this is not a place that constantly bashing anybody else. I mean, obviously, when you come from another company, when you come from WWE, you have to acknowledge the fact that they came from there. Do you know what I mean? And this is what I mean when it comes to Chris Jericho being a hypocrite. Here we go. I'm going to ask you what you're, what you, uh, one question. Why is NXT on Wednesday night? I mean, the, the, I suppose the answer would be because Dynamite was... Exactly. The they came on Wednesday just to mess with us. Take your head out of your ass and go make money. Don't worry about our company. We're not worried about you. We don't have a screen up. You mean to tell me that you're not worried about them? Really? Chris, you got to tell us with a straight face that you're not worried about them? Isn't this the same guy that calls himself the demo god? Isn't this the same guy when he was trying to put over Jake Hager unwittingly just randomly throws out a promo back in December about, oh, We the People is a bad idea for bad creative, even though fans were chanting along with We the People when Jack Swagger was interesting in WWE. I find that interesting how that works in this roundabout noggin of Chris Jericho in 2020. 
where he tells you one thing and then he does another thing. Look, I've never lost respect for Chris Jericho for what he does in the ring or his impact in the business. Chris Jericho is one of the greatest performers of all time. I love Jericho. But as a person, outside of the wrestling stuff and some of the stuff he mentions with politics, I'm starting to lose respect for the person. I want to make that clear. Because you're doing one thing and you do something else. They don't tell me you're just doing it just to work people, get people riled up. You do freaking believe that. Because every single person that's came into AEW from WWE has mentioned you as to why they do what they do character-wise. You mean to tell me that you weren't a part of Brody Lee initially mocking Vince McMahon when he first joined the Dark Order? Isn't it a coincidence that whoever who, is, who used to work for WWE just randomly pops up on Talk is Jericho? Mike Kyoto, Arn Anderson, FTR. So, I, I think, like, you are really <laughs> doing yourself a disservice by saying that you're not paying attention to them, but you do. You do. You do. You do. You do. You do. So I, I'm not buying that. Oh, we're not paying attention to him. Why, why would you give Rusev the line about the Brass Ring promo then? This stuff has nothing to do with my feelings of him that he needs to go home. I think he needs to go home because he's not doing anything that's interesting on television. I did not enjoy the Orange Cassidy feud. The only part of that feud that I enjoyed was the debate with Eric Bischoff. And that was it. The inner circle sucks. Nobody wants to see Chris Jericho and Jake Hager as tag team champions. I'd, I'd rather watch... I'd rather watch freaking... <laughs> Bruce Pritchard have a 30 minute match against... King Corbin then watch Jake Hager wrestle one match. I don't want to watch him wrestle. He sucks. He's not interesting. He's boring. I, I don't care for him. Demo God, Million Viewer Man, whatever the fuck you want to call yourself, go home and stay home. How about that, pal? Let's go. What else? What's wrong with AEW this week? FTR and Jurassic Express. Here's the guys all about cutting the ring in half and doing all this stuff. Yet they fall in line and do all the stupid stuff that every other tag team does in AEW. I didn't enjoy the match. I thought the match sucked. I'm not a fan of Jungle Boy. I'm going to break a lot of people's hearts here with me saying that, but I'm not a fan of Jungle Boy. I'm not. I. He comes off as very generic in his wrestling style. And it's one thing to look like Tarzan. But if that's all you got to you, why should I care about you? I, I, I'm just not a fan of Jungle Boy. I'm not a fan of Dino Douche. And I'm certainly as hell not a fan of Stunted Growth. So that, that was my thoughts on that match. And then... Tony Khan, I don't know what your obsession is with Orange Cassidy. I don't know if he has some personal info that he can share on Twitter on you. But who in the right mind really thinks that Orange Cassidy is going to beat Brody Lee for the TNT title? Like, you have this obsession that you need Orange Cassidy to be the main event of every aspect of Dynamite. Is he a good wrestler? Yes. Is his gimmick unique? Yes. But he's not a main event guy. No matter what the demo god wants to tell you, Orange Cassidy is still another guy in the roster in my eyes. Did Orange Cassidy just randomly become a main event world title contender after beating Chris Jericho in the Mimosa Mayhem, the stupidest match in wrestling in 2020 this year? Yeah, let's let's have Orange Cassidy take on Brody Lee because that's gonna that's gonna win everybody over, pal. I, I, I don't get it. I don't. 
So, now that was basically it. That's what I wanted to hit on for what the hell is wrong with AEW this week. So, um, yep. There you go. <laughs> you get a mixed bag with everything. I did, I really did enjoy Dynamite last night. I, Despite everything I just mentioned for the last five or eight minutes, uh, I did enjoy Dynamite this week. But, again, I'm not, I'm not going to come on here and kiss their ass every single week like all of you do. I'm just not going to do it. So, with that being said, I want to thank you guys so much for checking out episode 223 of the Hoots Podcast. Make sure to, first off, smash the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Make sure to leave us a four or five star rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere you get your podcasts from so it can help expand the reach of the show. And don't forget to bookmark ProWrestlingTransfers.com so you can follow along with all my coverage of the G1 Climax Tournament, the 30th anniversary. No, the 30th tournament of the G1 uh, Climax Series. So, uh, I want to thank you guys so much for the support. You can follow me on Twitter at the Hoops Podcast, Instagram Josh Lopez Night for at Josh Lopez Josh Lopez Music, and don't forget uh, Pro Wrestling Transcriptions dot com. And um, with that said, I'm Joshy. Don't forget to be the authentic product, the authentic product that is yourself, and pick your lanes and live on your own terms. I love you guys. Have a wonderful weekend. And we'll be here next week to get you ready. And we're getting closer and closer to Class of Champions. So uh, a lot of fun stuff around the horizon in the world of professional wrestling. And with that said, enough from my my freaking mouth this week. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for uh, checking out the show. I really hope you enjoyed it. Have a wonderful weekend. And I'll talk to you guys next week. For right now, let's send it off to Brother Carter for this week's edition of the Thoughts of Derrico. We'll talk to you guys next week. I guess sir. And now, the thoughts of Derrico. Listen well, man. Welcome, welcome, one and all, to the segment that can only have one response, and that's by you saying, Boy, that's some good sh, pal. It is The Thoughts of Derrico, featuring the one, the only, Brother Carter. Bray Wyatt is a freaking genius. I've said this many times before, but I think he's going to go on to become the greatest character of this generation. He's this generation's... Well, he's the first Bray Wyatt. I mean, a lot of people are going to compare him to The Undertaker, but... He's this. He's 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 going to be the greatest character of this generation, and the, and the the going back and forth between the fiend is just absolutely unbelievable. But this absolutely unbelievable. But this week on the Firefly Funhouse, when he brought the the Vince McMahon puppet and wobbly walrus out to imitate Paul Heyman, that's just freaking genius. I was dying laughing when I saw that on my screen. I think it's great. I'm not sure where Bray Wyatt goes from here. I think it's going to be some sort of program with Alexa Bliss. He may be getting involved with a potential feud between Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross, which I'd be okay with. Um, Nikki Cross could find find somebody to partner with. I'm not sure who that would be. I don't know if you bring somebody up from NXT or or what happens with that. But uh, I like this. I like what they were doing with the with the Firefly Funhouse this week. Thought it was absolutely great. And uh, to me, the other big thing that came out of SmackDown was Bailey's explanation of why she turned on Sasha. I liked it. Uh, I think that I, I liked the promo. I thought it was very, very, very well done. I am curious to see where they go from here. The uh, Sasha's back this week, so we'll see what her response is. The only thing I would say to this is that I don't believe that this feud should be for the title, and I think that Sasha should cost Bailey the SmackDown Women's Championship at. Clash of Champions, and then the two can settle their feud inside Hell in the Cell, and then keep it going through Royal Rumble Mania, however they want to do it. But um, I, I, I don't think I think you can take the title off of of Bailey. You know, give give somebody else a chance, let them run with it a little bit. Because again, I, I just don't think you need it. But I'm, I'm not sure who you give it to at this point. Maybe Lacey Evans, because I think I like what she's doing. Maybe Naomi. I'm not sure, but I think that you can take the title off. Uh, I think you can take the title off of Bailey. And then let the two just settle the difference in a grudge match. But I'm intrigued by it. 
and I'm very curious to see where they go from here. Uh, turning to Raw, folks, Seth Rollins is one of the absolute best in the world. That's He is on fire right now. What he's doing with Murphy, I think, is great. Uh, and he's still got that feud with the Mysterio family, so I think it's absolutely terrific. I'm curious to see what where they go from here. I think eventually we're going to get a Buddy Murphy, or sorry, just a Murphy-Seth Rollins feud, which I'm all in for. Both of those two are great workers, and I think that's going to be absolutely fantastic. So I can't wait to see that feud. I think that's going to be absolutely wonderful. And folks, Dominic Mysterio looks like a seasoned veteran inside of the steel cage. Like, he's been on the main roster for, or I guess I should say he's been on Raw for about a month now since SummerSlam. And already, he's had nothing but incredible matches. He knows how to work inside of a steel cage. This kid is the future. He is a future, future superstar, no question. And I know people are going to say, oh, the only reason he's getting the chance is because he's Rey Mysterio's son. Fine. But he's proved it. He's proved it every time he's gone in the ring, he is delivered. I am all in on Dominic Mysterio, and I cannot wait to see watch him grow over the next 20 years of his career. It's going to be absolutely terrific. Uh, the other thing that I thought coming out of Raw was was interesting was the Hurt Business are going up against Retribution. And I'm not quite sure how that pairing is going to work, but I'm I, I'm I'm interested. I I, I thought I figured it very when when the Hurt Business came out at the end of the Raw, they would ally themselves with Retribution, but it seems like they're going to go against them. So, I don't know how this is going to work out. You know, you figure you got heels going against heels. But it adds a sense of reality to it, which I like, and I'm I'm, I'm I, I like it. I, I was I was happy with how it went, and um, the Hurt Business, I mean, is absolutely incredible. MVP is the best he's ever been, you could argue, and I'm liking it. I'm liking where they're going to go from there, so or where they're going to go. So I think it's great. I actually really enjoyed AEW Dynamite this week. I thought that there was some really great stuff. From uh, from All Elite Wrestling this week. I enjoyed the opening tag team match between Jurassic Express and FTR. Some great action there. Really great match between Frankie Kazarian and Adam Page. That is what AEW needs to be doing. They need to be doing more of that and not that gimmicky, stupid stuff that people have been complaining about in WWE for years. Stick with great wrestling because they have great wrestlers. And I, you guys, I've, I've said before, you guys know my thoughts on Hangman Adam Page. I think he's one of the top performers in all elite wrestling. That buckshot lariat is buckshot lariat is something special, and we need to see more of that. But I thought that was great. Give us more great wrestling, please. MJF rules. He's absolutely incredible. I don't know what they're going to do with him in a stable. I don't. I think he just needs to be on his own. And I think eventually we're going to get a Wardlow MJF feud, which is going to be great. But MJF continues to be the golden child of AEW and the best part of their show. And then the last thing I'll say about AEW this week is props to Best Friends and Santana Ortiz. That parking lot brawl was done exactly right. They just destroyed each other, got all the aggressions out of their system. I thought that both teams delivered. It was intense. It was it was just a really fun match, but it had a sense of intensity to it. Orange Cassidy coming out at the end and helping his bro, helping his bros, what I thought was great. So real, and then Sue giving the one finger salute and driving off. I thought it was actually really funny. So great job from AEW this week. I really really enjoyed the show. And those are the thoughts of Derrico for the uh, for this week. I hope you've enjoyed it. My final thought for the week is that's some good pal. This has been The Thoughts of Derrico. You're smarter now, man.